small audience especially, please feel free to interrupt. If at any point you have a question or anything, just like raise your hand or look a bit you know, confused and, and, and tell me to slow down or clarify. So uh, what I'm really interested in is behavior, and especially in how behavior can be modified by molecular level changes. So what I mean by that is, for example, during the course of evolution, it's molecular level changes in DNA sequences that lead to sort of adaptive changes in behavior, and we'd like to understand more about that. And also, on the side of drugs, we want to understand how sort of relatively simple chemicals that you give to animals can modify the behavior. So to give an example, this is one of my uh, sort of favorite experiments. You may have seen this. This is from a BBC documentary. This is this uh, sort of Arctic fox selection experiment. And it's been going on for about 50 years. And these are the aggressive foxes, which is maybe not surprising from looking at them. Basically, for 50 years, each fox generation, I think it's a year, so we're talking 50 generations of foxes, um, they would select the foxes that were least comfortable with humans approaching them. And you just do that every year for 50 years, and eventually you get these foxes that um, just can't contain themselves. The you know, human hand nearby is enough to make them try to bite it. They just absolutely hate people. <laughs> what I think is really interesting is that in parallel, they were selecting for foxes that were especially comfortable with people. So you had this sort of split in the two populations. And <laughs> these foxes are completely different. They're totally happy to be with people. There's no biting going on. They even seem to appreciate a good cuddle from the uh, scientists running this study. And this is amazing, I mean, just, just to see, right, these, these stark behavioral differences that you see. But I think what's also really interesting about it is that the difference here is just at the level of the sequence of the DNA. So the scientists have selected for variation that was already out there in the foxes and the wild populations. And they sort of selected out those DNA sequences that led to more aggressive or less aggressive foxes. So I think that's, that's one interesting example. Another example, it's maybe appropriate for a pint of science event, is on the chemical side. You all know that uh, uh, chemicals can have substantial influence on our behavior. In the case of alcohol, it can lead to uncoordination, but also changes in mood and changes in inhibitions and things. So, um, the question that I'm very interested in is, you know, how do we find chemicals that are useful and interesting for changes in behavior? You could argue that alcohol is an okay chemical, but it would be nice if it were just as fun and less dangerous, for example. In the case of genetic changes, many changes are, are good and useful and lead to useful changes in behavior, for example, in a, in a fox, at least in a laboratory environment. Uh, and others, of course, are um, deleterious and lead to, lead to problems. So how do we find those sorts of molecular level changes that are good or bad? And I think you could argue that doing experiments in humans or foxes is very interesting, but also very difficult. So the fox experiment took 50 years. So it's a massive amount of sort of time and dedication to do it. And we'd like to make some of those discoveries a bit faster. And um, the way we try to do that is to turn to animals with shorter life cycles. So the worm that we work with is called C. elegans. It's a nematode worm. This is uh, what it looks like. So this plate that you see here is about five centimeters. You can hold it in your hand. So it's about sort of this, this scale. You got hundreds of worms on it. They eat bacteria. So that, you see that sort of lawn there, um, that brown splotch? That's the bacteria that they eat. That's their food. Uh, and if you zoom in, you can see these little worms. They're about a millimeter long. Uh, you can see them with the naked eye. If you just hold one of these plates up to the light, and you just get the angle right, you can see these just little commas crawling around. So that's sort of the scale that we're, that we're talking about. So a lot smaller than a fox or a human. And there's several interesting facts about worms that are relevant. Oh, I should just show you this picture as well. That's just an electron microscope image. Even when you zoom in, you see that they're uh, uh, a mostly featureless tube, which is good for certain purposes, especially for quantifying their behavior, for example. Um, so I mentioned the life cycle, the fast life cycle. This is one of the reasons they were chosen uh, by Sidney Brenner back in the 60s or so as a model organism. And they go from uh, an adult at the top through an egg all the way to a new adult in about three days. So instead of a year, we have something much, much smaller. If you want to uh, go through a lot of generations, it's, it's much more feasible in the world. Um, so a couple of points. Uh, the interesting thing about the development on the right here, this is happening partially in the animal, and then uh, most of it's happening just as an egg sitting on a, on a surface. It takes about 10 hours to get something that, from a single cell to something that looks recognizably like a worm. So that's great for studying developmental biology. The eggs are transparent, so you can see all of that going on with a normal <coughs> microscope. Um, normally, if conditions are good, they will go through these several larval stages, getting bigger at each stage, eventually to an adult. If things are bad, then 
if they're between the first and second larval stage, and they reach bad conditions, that means like crowding, lots of other animals around, no food, temperature's too high, they're uncomfortable, then they'll enter this alternative developmental stage. And this is sort of the graduate student's best friend, because this stage survives for months. So if you go on holiday, and you leave your plates, and you forget to seal them, and you come back, and they're sort of a, just a sort of, they look like a cheese and onion crisp at the end, instead of a nice hydrated gel. These dour larvae, they almost always survive. They'll live for months, they don't eat. And uh, when you then put them back on good conditions, you realize when you saved your experiment, they've survived. Uh, and then there's always one that sort of crawls out. It just enters back into its normal development and then continues. They're very convenient for working with in the lab. You can also freeze them. So we collect strains, we can freeze them, we can keep them essentially forever uh, without genetic changes. The other amazing fact about worms that's very relevant for us when we're thinking about behavior is that we know the full wiring diagram of their nervous system. So their brains and all their peripheral nervous system, you know, the full set of neurons in their body is just 302. So it's sort of a handful, they all have names. They get used to hearing their names and behaviors. And they're almost the same from one animal to the next. What's also really useful, as I said, is you know the wiring diagram. So this is, uh, this is what it looks like. So this is just all the cell bodies of the worm and all of their interconnections. Trying to understand how genetic change changes some property of a cell, which then leads to a change in the behavior. You've got a much better chance of doing it with this handful of neurons than you do if you're talking about billions of neurons in a fox or a human. So that's, that's a nice sort of fact. Um, if you want to know how this was done, maybe ask me after, but it's also sort of a good thing. Just like the eggs, the outlets are transparent, so you can do nice microscopy. Uh, this is a worm brain. Uh, the, uh, this is from Manuel Zimmer's lab in Vienna. They've introduced a calcium-sensitive dye into the neurons. When the neurons fire, you know, send signals, they use calcium, so the calcium concentration changes, and the brightness changes. And so, um, what you see in this video uh, is the worm thinking. So this is roughly real time, it's sped up a, a little bit. Um, but this sort of flashing, that's like single cell, resolution over time of a worm just trapped in a little chamber, thinking its thoughts. So it's also spontaneous activity even when the worm's not doing anything, not apparently doing anything. So that's sort of the worm and its nervous system. And I said we're interested in behavior. And you might think with 302 neurons you can't do very much. And when you first see worm behaving, you might feel sort of validated in that, but they're not really doing much. The head is here, by the way, so they're falling forwards, they make turns, and they can also reverse. And that's sort of how they navigate. That's how the, the worm explores the world. Um, but once you start looking a bit further, you realize they can actually do quite a lot. So just to give an example, um, out in the wild, it's very important for them to find the right bacterial food for them to eat. The problem with eating bacteria is that also for worms, they can be infected by their food. So they want to find a good, nutritious bacteria, but one that doesn't infect them. And they don't always know, you know, they haven't sort of experienced all bacteria. So they don't have a sort of innate preference, or at least not a perfect one. So they have to sometimes learn what's good and bad in their environment. So they can arrive at a patch of food, they taste the bacteria, maybe it tastes good, they eat it for an hour or two, and they realize they're getting sick. They'll leave, which of course makes sense. But what's interesting is if, let's say there was a high salt on the bad bacteria, and then you can take them from that plate, you put them on a plate with no bacteria, there's no risk, it's just a, an empty plate, and it's got a salt gradient, or maybe a patch with high salt, then they'll avoid that salt, because they remember that high salt is associated with bad bacteria, so they avoid that area and they search in other areas. And it's not just that the salt is intrinsically bad for them, it's only if you pair it first with the bad bacteria. So even with their 302 neurons, they're finding food, they're tasting it, they're figuring out that they don't feel well, and then they're remembering, for example, the salt and the temperature and avoiding it in the future. So they do really do a lot with 302 neurons. Um, they do even more when you put them together. Uh, so this is um, a video fairly recently collected by Serena Ding, who's a postdoc uh, in the lab. And you can see this is set up about, I'd say, 100 times, let's say. You see a few individuals roaming around, but you also see this swarm that's coming down from the top. So this is an entire wall of bacterial food, and they're just sort of swarming down, consuming the food. It looks a little bit like, uh, I think, a scene from Harry Potter or something, these uh, sort of, I don't know what they're called, but, uh, you know, the badges that leave the trails. And, um, they just consume this, consume this food in quite, I think, an incredible way. And another thing that's interesting about this from a genetic point of view is that we have strains that do this. They form these massive groups and swarm. And then we have strains of worms that differ just by a single nucleotide. So the sort of smallest genetic change you could make, if you make it in the right place, these solitary worms that basically ignore each other. 
Um, so this is one we think is really cool. We've always thought, so the, the, the basic fact of these sort of social and asocial worms has been around for maybe 20 years or so, as a sort of known thing that worms do. Um, and it always seemed like it must have some sort of function, and we could never really figure it out, and we still haven't really figured out what it might be good for. Um, but we're starting to try to push the worms a little bit harder to see. So this is another experiment that Serena did just maybe a week or two ago. Again, you've got your lawn of worms, but what you see in this case is the plate with the moist gel that they like to live on, and a dry plastic wall that they're climbing up. So normally for single worms, to climb up that wall is a very dangerous thing to do. They're so small that they dry out in seconds or minutes. It's uh, uh, just sort of a bit of plastic with nothing obviously wet on it. Um, but you can see these social worms that sort of team up together, form these sort of networks and bands, and they're able to climb the dry surface. Uh, so that's a potential function. Maybe they're able to escape from environments that they wouldn't otherwise be able to escape from. Another behavior that's been sort of fairly well described is um, this tower. So you push it a little bit harder, and now you say, well, it's not just a wall to climb, there's a complete gap. Loads of worms, hundreds, form this thing at the top. You zoom down, so this sort of thing is coming out at you into the screen. You zoom down and you see it's worms all the way down. And you can imagine that this is great for the worms for escaping a bad environment. You know, you imagine they're out, they're sitting in a rotting apple or something in nature. There's all sorts of surfaces, there's gaps they have to get over. Um, a single worm would never be able to bridge a massive gap, but hundreds of worms working together can. And that same mutation that I talked about that switches them from that social to solitary also affects this behavior, at least in, in the adults. Um, so we're starting to get a handle on what these sort of functions of these social behaviors might be, and also on the genetics. And, and the nice thing again about worms is that you can do all of this just in a few weeks in the lab. You can, you can tinker much more than you can with some other animals where the experiments take much longer. So I think that's a really uh, a nice thing about, about worms. Um, so my timer says 18, is that, is that correct? Do I have like two minutes left? Or do I have Keep more time? Okay, okay. So, okay. so I'm going to stop there. If you want to hear more about the you know, aggregation and genetics, then you can just ask me. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk instead about a sort of different way that we're thinking about behavior and genetics in worms, and it's something of a more uh, practical application. So here the idea is, you know, as I showed you, I think the behavior is maybe a bit more complicated than you would expect. You might, depending on your background, be surprised that the uh, sort of internals of a worm are quite complex. So in other words, worms have about 20,000 genes and humans have about 20,000 genes. So in terms of the number of genes that these worms have, it's comparable. And there's a decent amount of overlap. So something a little bit less than half, but more than a third, of the worm genes have a very clear human counterpart. And if we think in terms of neurons, then we think, say, neurotransmitters, like dopamine and serotonin are things you may have heard of. They control things like mood in uh, humans. Worms also have dopamine and serotonin, and they also use it to control their nervous system. So uh, one example of that is in uh, egg laying. So this is a close-up of a worm. This is the vulva here in the middle, and these are some eggs uh, arrayed along the worm. And I'll just play it, and you'll see these eggs pop out. So that's, that's what egg laying looks like in a worm. And we actually know the neural circuit that controls this. So if you remember, actually we know all the neural circuits, at least the identity of the neurons. And this one's been studied a little bit better than some of the others. And so we know also that uh, this depends on serotonin. So one of the main neurotransmitters that, that signals for the worm to lay an egg is serotonin. In humans, it's related to mood. And actually, if you give the worms antidepressants, they lay more eggs. And it's not because they were sad, and now they're sort of happier and they're laying more eggs. It's just that there's this deep connection, at least at the molecular level, between humans and worms. It's the same sets of molecules they're using to control their nervous system. So that presents this interesting possibility for a sort of application of this kind of work, which is basically to make disease models in worms that we think are relevant to human diseases. So a disease model is basically, in this case, just a worm that we think has a worm version of a human disease that we can understand and possibly, <clears throat> and possibly treat. So the way we do that is using genome sequences that we have now for humans and worms and other organisms. And out of those you know, two sets of 20,000, we look for overlaps. And we look for cases where we know there's strong genetic evidence for a disease-causing mutation in a human, where worms also have the same gene. So then if we cause a similar kind of change in the worm gene, then we can look at that worm and see, is it sick in some way? Does it behave differently? And if it does, then that sort of difference in the behavior 
is a symptom, let's say, of the worm's disease. Then what we can do is take drugs that, or at least compounds that might be candidate drugs, and ask, do they help the worm? Can we cure that worm version of the disease? And because there's this strong genetic connection in that case, we think there's a reasonable chance that the drugs we find that are effective in worms will have an okay chance of being effective in humans. And um, I don't have any um, sort of punchline for this, but let me just show you a few things that we're starting to do. Uh, so this isn't from our lab, this is from uh, Shi Wong in Alan Morgan's lab up in Liverpool. On the left is a healthy worm. It looks very different from the one I showed you before because this one is just swimming in fluid. The one I showed you before was, was crawling on the, on the surface, so it looks a bit different. But this is a, a basically healthy worm. This is a worm that has a defect or it has a deletion in a GABA receptor. So GABA is another neurotransmitter, the worms have it, humans have it. And you can see that this worm is certainly not moving the same way before. And if you look carefully at the head, you can see the sort of contraction of the head. They call it head bobbing in their, in their paper. Basically, the worm is having a seizure. And GABA receptors are also involved in some types of uh, epilepsy in humans. So the idea here is that this is a worm model for a human disease. It's very important to try to come up with new drugs for epilepsy because about a third of people with epilepsy don't respond to existing drugs. So there's a good reason to sort of try to find more. Um, once you have this sort of model, you can then say, well, because these worms are small, we can raise thousands of them in the lab, and we can reasonably quickly screen for new drugs. Because drug discovery is still really as a discovery process rather than a design process. There's much more sort of randomness and serendipity than you might like, um, and really the only way to do it is to screen very many compounds. And so this will allow us to screen many more than you might be able to in, um, in our systems. Um, and so my background actually is in physics, not in, in biology, and so presented with this problem, we thought, well, they're doing this manually, looking at the worms, seeing these contractions, and trying to find drugs that help. Oh, by the way, it's an important point, actually, is that they gave them a drug that works in human epilepsy, and it also helped the worms. So that's another sort of indication that this isn't a crazy thing to try. You, know, you give them the human drug, and it, it helps the worms. So maybe if we find other examples that help the worms, it might work the other way. Um, but I thought, let's try to automate it, let's try to do this in a more quantitative way where we can screen many more drugs. And so we built a system to uh, uh, record them. This is a six camera imaging system. We have one of these little plates with a bunch of bones underneath it. And we have all six in parallel. We have a few little stations there we can move the cameras between them. Uh, and get through, get through a lot. I'll just go very briefly through this. We record videos. Um, we subtract the background, so we're able to sort of automatically find the worms. We only save those pixels, which saves us on hard drives. Um, and if you zoom in, you can see we still have enough resolution that we can see those sort of postural differences that are going to be important for identifying these worm symptoms that we, that we want to identify first and then try to correct. We also write software to automatically extract the midline of the worm. So if you can see this line here, this is a line that sort of describes how long the worm is, it describes its shape and where it's moving. So you can imagine that what I showed you before with the head bobbing, we would be able to see that, for example, as a difference in the length, or maybe the head getting closer to the tail. So it's a way of sort of automatically having a computer recognize for us what these symptoms are. So if we're then screening a large number of drugs, the computer will just tell us that one is interesting, follow up on that one, because it's, it seems like another problem. We use those midlines to extract a whole different array of parameters. So we can say, for example, how fast is the worm moving, What's the angular speed? So how fast is it sort of turning in each segment? We can find sort of relative speed between different body parts. We also look at curvature, at length, how wide they are. Uh, and so we sort of build up this fingerprint of the worm's behavior. And that's sort of like doing a worm physical. We get this set of numbers that describes the health or lack of health of the worms. And that's important, first of all, because it gives us more opportunities to recognize things that might be wrong with our disease models. But it also lets us say not just on that one parameter, are you improving the worm, but on a variety of parameters, just really look at healthy. And that, that can be really important. Like, let's say the diseased worm is hyperactive, and the only thing you measure is how fast they go, and then you give them compounds and slow them down, they might just be killing them. So it's important that you don't only follow one parameter, but you have this sort of, this, this multi-dimensional view of the behavior so that you can be a bit more confident that you're helping rather than rather than 